This video is about economic changes that happened in Europe towards the later part of what's called the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages or Medieval Times. It's all the same thing. Um, this first section, room number one, is all about farming changes that occurred. So we have iron plows. That was in there for you. There's a new harness that is used with horses instead of oxen. The horses were faster, which led to more land being plowed in a day. And also you have this allowed peasants to make fields bigger and more crops could be planted, which all of this combined lead, led to more farmland. And there'll be another example. You can see there's another arrow going down below to a section that also created more farmland. Before I move on, I'll say that if at any point in the video you need to pause it to catch up and to fix your notes, then you should do that and then unpause it when you're ready to move on. So another farming change had to do with what's the fill-in for number one is, so check your work for that. Also something called the three field system, and you probably have something about um, what was in each field, and if you wrote legumes without an example, you might want to write an example, and what this, how this helped Europe was that you had more farmland um, that was being used at once and they had a crop rotation system that allowed some land to rest basically and not be used that would be more fertile in the future and you can see in part B I gave you some examples of how legumes were helpful so you might want to write one of those in. So this also led to more farmland for Europe and these improvements led to more food and then with more food in Europe the population grew. So these were all positive changes for Europe. All right, moving on. The next section has to do with improvements in trade and travel. So in around the 1100s, the foreign invasions as well as feudal warfare declined, which led to more travel because it was safer for people. Wealthy nobles now wanted goods that couldn't be made on the manors, so they're shifting away from the manorialism system. Make sure this fill-in is correct. Then we have expansion of trade routes. So in order to get the goods that couldn't be found on the manor, you need to trade and go elsewhere. So I think I included the first fact for you. And then another fact is that the goods were coming from the Middle East and East Asia. So in B, I gave you some examples of what are the goods coming from the Middle East or East Asia. So I just, if you connect, what's in A2 to B1, it makes a little more sense. So the trade route was that um, these goods were shipped to Venice, then they were traveled on land on mules north to Flanders, which was a region in Europe. If you're all set with page one, you want to move on to page two. So in Flanders, there were trade fairs, so make sure you fill that in at the top. And also, as a result of the trade fairs, you had towns and cities growing. So, basically, the trade fairs had to end after the fall because it was winter. And it was cold and too hard to move around. So, the merchants would settle in the towns and cities where the trade, fair were, trade ugh, fairs were. And they would stay there for the winter. And then number two is a fact about the artisans. So people are starting to settle here, and this led to the centers of trade becoming the first medieval cities because people were attracted to the centers of trade, and they settled there, and they became the first medieval cities. So that is how it all happened, and I just gave you for number four the population range for some towns. So now you have a town. What happens next? Well, you have to figure out how to run the town and what's going to happen. So that's where, oops, before we move on, look at what I typed in for number five. 
the two the cities that were at each end of the trade route in the north and south they were the richest probably because they had the most trade going in and out of them all right so you've got this town then what then you're going to have a charter so you need to make sure your definition is correct if you didn't use a glossary it may not be correct but the charter is going to tell you what a town can and can't do the rights and privileges so a merchant would get a charter from a local lord or king then to get this charter the merchant had to give a lot of money a yearly fee or both so that's how the charter was granted for what I have in number three so I also typed in for you or I think I wrote in for you number four um, and number five tells you once the population starts growing and manors were overcrowded that peasants could buy freedom to move to towns and wouldn't that be great for them better than being a peasant for their whole life See, isn't this video thrilling? Anyway, also, just so in case you're wondering, my Halloween decorations are still up. So the next section has to do with changes in business. Let's see what we got. Commercial revolution. It does not have to do with commercials on TV. They did not have TV in the Middle Ages, in case you were wondering. Anyway, so there was more trade which re re led to the increased use of money it's kind of dwarfed by all the writing I have around it alright so more and more people are actually using money and there's a bigger need for what's called capital which is money for investment and so banks would often give this out and today if you need to start a business you would need a lot of capital that's not a word that just relates to the middle ages it's a general word life word I guess alright so people need capital to start their businesses some people would start a partnership now a lot of people did not write the definition from the glossary of for partnership so you may not have the best definition if you did not do that so you might want to pause the video and fix your definition in the definition, it talks about a large scale of venture. That should not be confused with an adventure. It does a partnership does not have to do with taking a trip anywhere. It has to do with starting a business. So the benefits of partnerships were a there was more money to start the business, there was more capital for the business. Alright, if you put two people together. If I can if I have only five thousand dollars in my life savings I could use all of that or if I had a partner maybe I'm gonna use three thousand and they're gonna use three thousand and together we're gonna to have more than I would have had on my own if only and only the five thousand alright so that's helpful and then it's the system of partnership is less risky because you didn't have to invest all of your money in the business like I was just saying I didn't I, my life savings is five thousand dollars I'm not investing all the five thousand dollars into the business I'm only putting three thousand and so if if I do not succeed I've lost less money so and I probably would not succeed because I am not really good at entrepreneur type things and businesses although I have lots of ideas for things that could be good businesses anyway so it's less risky for the people involved because you're not investing so much money from the outset when you're starting the business all right if you're all set with your information you want to move on to the third page last page all right so another new business practice would be oh, I started that by accident, but we can listen to it for a second. That was the start of Bob Marley, Three Little Birds. Bob Marley is one of my favorite musicians. Anyway, so now we have this thing called insurance. So if I'm a merchant and I need to ship something somewhere, I might buy insurance. I'm going to pay someone for the insurance, and the underwriter is going to insure my shipment for close to its value of whatever it's worth then if my shipment if something happens to it um, bef between point A and point B 
then I am given some of the shipment's value. If it arrives fine, I will just lose the insurance payment. So it's a benefit to the merchant because you have some guarantee that you're not going to have a total loss in case something happens to your shipment. This is still used today at the post office. If you send something, you may be asked or your parents may be asked if you want to buy some insurance. If you're sending something expensive, you might want to. If you're sending something that's only worth like 20 bucks, maybe not. All right, so we've got insurance. Lastly, we have, well, we have credit, the system of credit and buying things on credit and owing someone later for your purchase. Then we have something called a bill of exchange, which I abbreviate B-O-E. All right, so in the bill of exchange, I let's say I need to go to Paris and I'm in London. I've always wanted to go to London. I've never been there, not yet at least. All right, so I'm going to put money in the bank in London. I'm going to get a piece of paper, the bill of exchange, and I'm going to travel to Paris, and I'm going to give them my bill of exchange, and they're going to give me the money that my bill of exchange is for. So this is good because I don't have to travel with gold coins away down my pockets or be loud, and the gold coins were easy to steal. So this is a good system for the merchants. So you can just tuck that little piece of paper somewhere and maybe no one realizes that you have it. That might happen if someone, if you're traveling with gold coins and not a bill of exchange, they're out to get you. Demons closing in at every side. So this actually is going to be thrilling for the peasants. This is going to be good for them. So look at B, society begins to change. So what's going to happen is the increased use of money decreased serfdom and decreased pe the peasant social class. So basically the same thing. All right, why? The lords wanted money to buy their special goods. Now, if you remember, this is on page one. All right, so the lords want money, not a lifetime of service. So, the peasants began to sell farm goods. They were paying rent for a section of farmland so that they could farm and then have goods to sell. They would sell their farm goods and they would get money that they would give to the Lord and they would not owe a lifetime of labor to the Lord anymore. They would just owe money to rent the space of farmland that they needed to grow the farm goods that they would then sell. That's where they get the money from. So they are not tied to the lords for life anymore. This is going to decrease the peasant system, like the whole feudal system and the peasant social class. And we will study this later, the whole decline of feudalism. Why did that happen? This is one of the reasons why it happened. So lastly, the peasants become tenant farmers. So check your definition. Make sure you have that correct because not everyone had a great definition for that. And the peasants are becoming tenant farmers. They're renting the, the space of land to farm, and they're giving the Lord their rent money for the farmland. It's just like if you have an apartment, you pay a landlord money for the apartment. The, the peasants are paying money for the space of farmland. So this is definitely thrilling and good for them. So the last fact uh, we're not going to focus on. All right, so... This has been the Chapter 7, Section 4 Outline video. I hope you got good information and your notes are top-notch. And if you miss something, you can always rewind the video and go back to the spot. All right, I hope you liked some of this old school music Michael Jackson's thriller and this has been super cool history class I hope you learned something and see you next time